Welcome to episode 438 of Cinematary. I'm your host, Zach Dennis, and I'm here with... Grace Winburn. Seth Troyer. And Andrew Swafford. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about movies that we saw this week in part one. And in part two, we're going to continue our Muppet series with 1981's The Great Muppet Caper, a.k.a. Charles Grodin is deeply in love with Miss Piggy. <laughs> If that doesn't sell you, doesn't what will? He's got swine flow. I'm already seeing how hard it is to do puppets on, like, the way they did with the monitors. They would always be watching a monitor so they could actually, like, see what their performance looks like. But you have to go the opposite direction. Um, and I'm already realizing I, I, would, I would need a lot of practice before I got there. You could put on a quick puppet show for our YouTube viewers. Just like, I, I, you know, this is... He does this is learning. I, I, I thought that this one was going to talk, but actually this one talked. See? It's very confusing. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. This is kill this is Monopoly great. This is great. Yeah, this is great audio. <laughs> <laughs> the audio <laughs> listeners are in their car doing their workouts, you know, like this is great. My cat is in uh, the dressing room. I see that yeah. back there. This is a My really cat. good technique to like mimic <laughs> Henry. someone. All right, well, Seth, we're going to start it with you. Why don't you talk about puppets to kick us off with the storyteller? Oh, I'm... Okay. Um, yeah, I, I just figure since we're doing the Muppet Week, Jim Henson is one of my favorite people who ever lived, uh, and I've always been a big fan of all of his work, even the shitty stuff. And the ones... There's um, a series that is kind of underseen, uh, aired on NBC in 1987 called The Storyteller, uh, starring John Hurt, which, you know, you might know from various things. He's the British man with the voice, one of the many British men with the voice. And uh, it's him and a puppet dog and in kind of like a castle or something, and they tell you stories, as you might have imagined. Um, but the style of the way they, they show it. It's like European folklore and things like that. And the style is very much um, in the key of Dark Crystal more than, uh, say, what we're going to talk about, which is the Muppet Caper, uh, which if you don't know about the Dark Crystal or Labyrinth, um, Jim Henson has this other side, which Storyteller falls into, which is this sort of darker, more realistic um side which sort of sprang out of Yoda basically the beginning of those more uh realistic like stranger more for like this is that these ideas of more adult um storytelling when it comes to puppets which is you know kind of a silly idea to contemplate but that's how Jim Henson was he was always exploring silly ideas to contemplate and bring them to like absurd epic levels of fruition uh and I think he does it with the storyteller, which I think there was, there's not a ton of episodes, but uh, there's, a, there's a season that came out and they are like really amazing uh, in the 80s. And each one is its own, has its own like creatures in it. And uh, they're basically already like kicking the shit out of some of the stuff you'll even see, like Guillermo del Toro, like, and it's like still trying, I feel like still trying to keep up with some of the things he's doing with like the way the creatures look in this. Um, and again, similar to the Dark Crystal and Labyrinth and all that. Uh, it air like one of my favorite ones is the first one, which is about a hedgehog guy. And he's like a big old hedgehog person. Uh, love that one. And there's like these ones about like, of course, it's like European folklore, so there's a lot more like grim fairy tale, like darkness to them. So they are like kind of surprising. A lot of them, like somebody's head just tumbles off, or there's devils and things like that. It's really good stuff. I know they eventually, after his death, they did a Greek myths one, which explores obviously Greek myths, um, which I haven't seen, but it's directed by Brian. Henson, his son, which are pretty good. Mm hmm. Yeah. And they are talking, and I guess it's still happening, about bringing it back with Neil Gaiman as the titular storyteller telling you the story. Um, another British guy with a voice. Uh, so I think that would work pretty good. Um, but yeah, 
gotta put the plug in there and yeah yeah oh yeah the labyrinth is a little more hokey but fun but dark crystal i think is like one of the it's one of my favorite movies it's just like astounding achievement of like everything you are seeing on the screen is artificial like everything was handmade by a person uh and it all looks so like wild and convincing and you have no idea like how big anything actually is like what is this sound stage and um just so much craftsmanship in that uh and again like i love anything that blurs that line where it, we don't get very often is like this sort of like is it for kids is it not for kids like what is going on here and it's definitely jim like shooting his shot trying to make something big uh and bold rather than just making uh another muppet movie which you know he's accused plenty of times as being like kind of like a walt disney who's just trying to cash in or something on big success but i think uh which he did get beat down after the lack of success with his more epic endeavors like that but i'm glad he did some of it andrew as as the as y'all explored through the muppets did you ever have you watched labyrinth or dark crystal or any of these other jim henson things i've just watched labyrinth um which i like enough um but not enough to make me want to watch dark crystal but um your pitch is selling me oh andrew yeah Yeah. i'm trying i'm trying andrew I'll get into it in part two, but I guess he was wanting to make Dark Crystal before this one, but they kind of were like, yeah, you need to make a Muppet movie before you go off into the Dark Crystal. Yeah, whatever the hell it was. Uh, (laughs) And uh, then I was also going to talk about uh, David Armsby's Dinosaur series. It's on YouTube. You can watch, I think it's six parts. They're, each one is like under 10 minutes long um, and they are sort of these they almost look rotoscopy it's like definitely stylized but it, each one is just like these silent dinosaur stories um, each one following a different kind of dinosaur and a different kind of like part of the world it seems uh, and it's it, it kind of differentiates itself from some sort of like documentary-esque kind of dinosaur thing like it reminds me of like those walking with dinosaurs that they did like forever ago on like discovery oh, this is, channel or something oh this is a recent thing it is 2022 um oh shit oh, okay. i think they've been coming out uh i think <laughs> I, when yeah i know i don't i thought this was like from the 60s i know i always talk <laughs> about stuff that didn't come out this year um but it did uh, come out last year now but um, oh, this looks cool it's really good um <laughs> And this the style is really interesting. I'm having a hard time like really explaining what it looks like, but it is like really elevates it and gives it sort of an expressionistic quality, as much as it is aiming for scientific realism. Like there's definitely more updated. Like T Rex has feathers at a, in one of the episodes. There's a lot of the feathered dinosaurs and more updated evolution ideas. Um, but they're also just like really touching some of them, and they're really intense. Like emotionally for five being five minute shorts uh another thing i've always been a fan of is dinosaurs and dinosaurs in cinema and it feels like one of the first things in a long time that really feels like it's you know in conversation with o'brien or harry Hausen as far as like making those animals that we will probably you know unless jurassic park happens never see uh, making them visible to us on screen, uh, and they're they're really great. I I think they you should go check them Is, out. Are they like um are they like standalone things? Or are they like trying to teach you about the different types of dinosaurs? What's the again? It's not very dessert? educational. Uh, like some of okay. them are like a triceratop lays down and he has a dream about like the life he could have or something like some of them are almost like existential or something um there's a lot of like you know just mom protecting babies from being eaten and stuff like that but uh yeah there's no each one is it seems like it's in different probably a different 
Jurassic era or something and dealing with different animals. I just looked. It's, I guess if you go search Dinosauria on YouTube, I kind of want to watch them. They're cool. Oh, yeah. Do it. Okay. All right. Dinosauria. Andrew, I'm tossing it over to you. You you saw the is it? There's two donkey movies of the year, but this seems to be the front runner for donkey movie of the year. This is the donkey movie of the year. Um, donkey. Now the other donkey movie of the year, Banshees of Inisherin, uh, has a very cute donkey, right? Quality um, donkey. It's. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> that donkey ass. is Fabulous you know. Ass. <laughs> truly, yeah. Fabulous ass. Um, Great, great friend of Colin Farrell. Loves to be indoors. Uh, This donkey that I'm going to talk about um, has a very different experience. Um, The movie that I watched this weekend was EO uh, by a Polish filmmaker. You know, one could say that. Um, (laughs) The director is Jerzy Skolomowski. Uh, He is Polish. I have not seen anything else by him, but... Uh, looking into his filmography, it actually is pretty deep. Uh, he goes all the way back to the 60s. Um, and the stuff I'm seeing looks like he was making silent shorts, just kind of as a throwback or an avant-garde experiment or something. And his, his filmography has been all over the place since then. But this is how he came on my radar. Um, I know this movie has been making uh, buzz in the festival circuit. Uh, I wasn't really sure what to expect. Um, and it certainly wasn't what I got, um, which was a very interesting cool movie i um or maybe i should take that back and say that i i did know what to expect which is i was kind of assuming this was going to be an all hazard balthazar riff um and i i have kind of a uh, a bad uh, history with that movie where i watched it um way before i was you know at the right stage in my cinephilia to actually get on robert brisson's wavelength and um, I was just like traumatized by boredom um, in Al Hazard Balthazar. I've not gone back and watched it since. So I was a little worried this would be that. Um, but it's, it's very much not. Um, <laughs> it, if uh, if Brisson's movie is like min- like extremely minimalist, this is like the maximalist opposite of that. Um, we are following the life of a donkey. We are seeing through that donkey's eyes, more or less. Um, he is our, our POV character. Um, and this donkey just kind of bounces around from owner to owner and situation to situation. Um, and one thing to know about donkeys, at least from what I'm learning in this movie, <laughs> is uh, they're very quiet and slow and don't, like, emote a lot. Um, so in order to get inside the subjective emotional headspace of this donkey um uh Skolomowski fills the space with like a lot of cinematic technique and a lot of music um the opening of the movie is eo uh in a circus he's a circus animal and um we are uh, like seeing the adoring crowd and hearing this like really bombastic music and there's like strobing red lights um uh, though the the music that we're hearing is not um diegetic music it's it's like this instrumental um like droney synth music uh, that has been written for the movie um and one thing that i was really impressed and surprised by was just how much of the movie is is driven by uh, just really really gorgeous instrumental music um it almost feels like a a musical with no like sung lyrics in it um we're just kind of getting uh the donkey's emotional headspace as communicated through um music and um there it, it's it is interesting to to live the life of a donkey for a little while uh, like at one point he goes to um a farm uh, that is owned by somebody who has like a show horse and um you get like this donkey's impression of this horse um in a way that like um you know a uh, a teen high school movie might portray 
like a, a, a nerdy male character seeing like the most beautiful girl in school for the first time. You know, like this this horse is presented as like the most glamorous thing to ever exist. Um, and it, it gets its own like slow-mo instrumental musical sequence. Um, and so the, the movie is, is kind of on that wavelength. Um, and if that sounds boring to you, I... I don't really know what to say other than I can assure you it is not like I, I was kind of expecting to be bored during this movie, but, but I never was. Um, it's very thrilling. It's very emotionally involving. Um, it, it's continues being interesting plot wise. Like EO is kind of constantly on to the next thing, like running away from owners or, you know, getting, uh, apprehended whenever, you know, somebody has been mistreating him or whatever. Um, I will say if people are, concerned about you know seeing sad things happen to animals in movies this is definitely a movie in which sad things happen to animals um but uh the director does spare us uh the worst of that um there's a moment where eo gets shot um by some hunters i believe and it when that happens it then cuts to um a little um like oh man what do you it's almost like a um like a drone robot or something with um, with with little arms and legs uh, crawling around in in the forest, um, and I I don't know if that is like to what extent we're supposed to think that that is just a representation of EO, like we're we're kind of being spared the gory reality of of what his experience actually is, or if this drone robot is in its of in and of itself like its own character. Um, but there is also um, a um, a very merciful cut um, when EO does die at the end of the movie. So spoiler alert, the donkey dies in the donkey movie. Um, but Andrew. you don't have to experience that with the donkey. So I thought that that was, that was a kindness on the director's part uh, for me not to have to oh, live worse. through that. Um, but... It is a good movie. Uh, what can I say? It was very interesting. Um, have I sold it or have I repulsed it you? <laughs> lost all its mystery now. <laughs> wow. I mean, it's, they can't resist it's about, that kind of thing. It's about the jur- the donkey journey you had along the way. It's about the circle Chekhov's of life. donkey. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Shoot an animal. <laughs> Gotta fucking die. <laughs> So, and then they and then they open up the donkey and it begins our next movie. Yeah, and then you start watching the autopsy uh, by David Pryor, um, which I cannot recommend oh, enough. Great transition. Um, <laughs> rules. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with with David Pryor, it is time to get familiar, people. Um, di- different uh, spelling of Pryor, actually. Oh. Um, P R I. There you go. That's it. Um, if you are unfamiliar with this guy, he is the guy who made The Empty Man. I sometimes refer to him as Mr. Empty Man. Um, and if you have not watched The Empty Man, wake up, sheeple. You need to watch The Empty Man. Uh, it is time to become empty. Um, that is a movie that did not really get the audience that it deserved because of the the awful fumbling of its release uh, it was the very last movie uh put out with the fox label um and and kind of w- the the distribution got botched because of the fox disney merger um and uh, i think it also played very briefly in theaters during like the height of covid and, and nobody saw it um but that movie is fantastic. One of the best horror movies of the last several years. Um, and I think a lot of folks thought that that was kind of a fluke, The Empty Man. Um, like, it just seems like such a singular one-off thing. But uh, The Autopsy, David Pryor's follow-up to it, um, I think proves that he is, like, should be a major name, a major figure in, like, the horror uh, film scene right now. Um, this came out as part of uh, Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities, I think is what it's called. Uh, the Netflix, uh, uh, you know, people are calling it a series or a TV show, but uh, it's, I mean, it's it's uh, del Toro doing Alfred Hitchcock Presents, basically. Um, he's he's coming out at the beginning of every episode, introducing the filmmaker, introducing the film, and, and doing a little, like, cryptic, jokey bit. Um, 
But, you know, really what it is, is Del Toro kind of using his clout as a way of spotlighting some pretty unappreciated filmmakers in his whole scene. Uh, so uh, I know there's one by uh, Panos Cosmatos who made Mandy. Uh, there's one by um, Chris, um, uh, Catherine Hardwick. Uh, there's one by Jennifer Kent. Um, and there are others that I'm not thinking of right now. I have not seen all of those. I've heard that they're kind of hit or miss, but I did need to watch the one by Mr. Empty Man. So the autopsy um, I watched, and and it is a fantastic, fantastic movie. This is pretty much a two-hander. Uh, there's there's more or less just two actors in this movie. Uh, Glenn Turman, um, who um, I did not recognize his name, but he's been in a lot of stuff. He was in Gremlins. He was in Deep Cover. Uh, he was in Super 8. Uh, and then the other actor is F. Murray Abraham, um, who I'm sure more people will be familiar with uh, from like Amadeus, etc. Um, but uh, F. Murray Abraham is a coroner, does autopsies, and he's friends with Glenn Turman's uh, like sheriff character. Um, and the plot is that in this like Appalachian coal mining town where the movie takes place, they have found this very strange body. Um, that like has no blood in it um and has been you know mangled and and seemingly eaten um in in various ways and and they want to find out um how this this body came to die um so f murray abraham's character is brought in um he does an autopsy on the body it turns out there are a lot of other bodies that were kind of found around the same area, and he does autopsies on all of them. Um, and it's it's a bit of a, a, a fun little mystery for a while as he's, like, hunting for clues and gathering evidence. He's kind of learning a little bit more about the phenomenon that's afflicting this town um, with each new body he examines. Um, and... There, I am a little squeamish about like medical body horror stuff. Like I, I really, I get squeamish about people getting shots in movies because they always want to give you the close up on the vein when that happens. Um, and so some of the, you know, handling of organs and stuff was a little hard for me because it's very convincingly done. Um, but it's not. Um, it doesn't feel like gratuitous or violent. It is it is a medical professional doing their job, more or less. Um, and I don't want to say too much about where the movie ends up going, um, but it it kind of becomes a a, a sort of Lovecraftian uh, cosmic horror thing that is really easy to do badly. Um, and this does it fantastically. That was another big strength of The Empty Man. It found ways to uh, put the ideas that are associated with Lovecraft um, on screen um, in, a, in a way that like the ideas kind of resist being put on screen because they're so um, you know indescribable by definition. Um, but David Pryor, I think, is really keyed into like the philosophy underpinning Lovecraft's work, and he uh, finds ways to, to visualize it um, in, in ways that other filmmakers haven't. Like, there's a, a scene near the end of this where the camera goes, like, inside somebody's, like, body and nervous system um, in a way that I've not quite seen before. Um, and, and like, we have this a very interesting, like, Lovecraftian monster who uh, actually talks to uh, the main character. Um, and... Uh, that is that is strange to be able to to actually speak to some sort of eldritch being, um, and uh, like this movie is scary both in its execution, its visuals, um, its its tension, its atmosphere, but also in its ideas. Like it, I I was very unsettled, like just hearing this monster speak to me watching this movie. Um, so. You know, highest recommendation for me, absolutely fantastic. David Pryor, he's a real one. I've been um, listening to interviews uh, with him, and uh, he's just an incredibly smart dude. Um, got his start in the film industry by helping uh, put together a special edition DVD set of Alien, because he's obsessed with that movie, um, and and then, like, got tapped to do, like, behind-the-scenes documentaries for, like, 
um, David fin- a bunch of David Fincher movies, um, and what else? Um, um, Inside Lewin Davis, Master and Commander, um, all The Fly, um, all sorts of stuff. So like he's actually he's like learned from a lot of the greats behind the scenes without before he actually you know got to go out in the world and make his own stuff and and i think that that shows and like the level of craft and expertise um he's able to bring to uh to the form um so yeah i'm, I'm prior pilled everyone else should be too in my opinion oh yeah i uh smashed the watch the watch list button so oh yeah uh, you said my you said all my sizzle sizzle words <laughs> your sizzle words yeah you know, like when you're, uh, if you work for Pizza Hut for any length of time, you have to say various, like, and it's fresh ingredients, it's like fresh, crisp, <laughs> you know, things like that. For me, it's Lovecraftian and, uh, colonoscopy. You know, anything that points to a Shoggoth. That too. Next week on Cinematary, we, we reveal our sizzle words. Shoggoth. Not a All right, we're going to take a quick break and then we will be back getting to the bottom of who's stealing these jewels with the great Muppet caper after this. There'll be spectacle, there'll be fantasy, there'll be daring do and stuff like you would never see. Maybe a movie. Yeah, we're going to be a movie. Starring out. Heroes bold, there'll be comedy, and a lot of fuss that ends for us real happily. We, we can watch it all develop, starring everybody and me. We'll take the world and set it on its ear. Come on, join in. We're gonna start right here. <laughs> it's okay, I landed on my head. And we are back with part two of episode 348 of Cinematary. In this part, we're going to continue our Muppet series with 1981's The Great Muppet Caper, directed by Jim Henson, from a script by Tom Patchett, Jay uh, Tars, Jerry Jewell, and Jack Rose. The film stars Kermit the Frog, Fozzie Bear, Miss Piggy, The Great Gonzo, Charles Grodin, and Diana Rigg. Uh, in the second live-action Muppets film, intrepid journalists Kermit, Fozzie, and Gonzo snag an assignment reporting on a British jewel heist. Twin, twin brother. Twin yeah, brothers. Yeah, you forgot identical, identical twins. Identical, identical twin, twin, twin brothers, twin. brothers <laughs> Kermit and Fozzie. Um, arriving in England, the trio settles in at the Rochus Happiness Hotel and seeks out socialite Lady Holiday, the victim of the theft. Soon, Miss Piggy arrive, er, appears, intending to work for Lady Holiday, but she ends up being framed by the aristocrat's scheming brother, Nicky. Kermit and company work to clear Piggy's name. The Great Muppet Caper marked the first feature film directorial debut for Muppet creator and performer Jim Henson. As the Muppets show was winding down production for good, Jim Henson was making plans to break off into new creative areas and eventually settled on two ambitious projects. One was a new television series that eventually became Fraggle Rock, the other a puppet-based fantasy film titled The Dark Crystal that he planned to direct. Even in the early stages, it was becoming clear that the Dark Crystal was going to be complicated, a complicated and expensive endeavor that'd be even riskier since Henson had never directed a feature before. At did you know he initially wanted to do it with uh, subtitles and in some made-up language? Wow. They talked him They talked him down. Uh, Wish he would have gotten to live his dreams. <laughs> uh, at the same time, people were still clamoring for more of the Muppets. We want more Muppets. With that, a deal was struck. If Henson agreed to direct a new Muppet movie first, he'd then be allowed to direct The Dark Crystal. Frank Oz, in a 1981 interview talking about the water ballet sequence with Miss Piggy, said, quote, The water ballet scene with Miss Piggy was really wonderful. I was under the water for a week. 
I had three days of scuba training, and then down I went. Having them swim for the first time really was exciting. It's amazing, though. You work and work on the most difficult things, and people say, that's nice. Then something easy will occur, and it will be all anyone talks about. In the first movie, it was Kermit riding a bike. It was very easy to do that. It was just a simple marionette with strings. In the same film, there was that whole complicated sequence with Gonzo in the balloon crashing into the sign and landing in the car. It took forever to film that, and all they talk about was the bike. That's why we have a whole bicycle parade in this film. <laughs> um, the New York Times in 1981 said, Here is a thoroughly genial movie, a combination of A.A. A. Milne, Busby Berkeley, and a small bit of Blake Edwards, in which Kermit, Miss Piggy, Fozzie Bear, and the other Jim Henson, Frank Oz puppets become involved with Diana Rigg, Charles Grodin, and a number of guest stars in a not quite all singing, all dancing romantic melodrama about jewel thievery in the London of hot couture. Great townhouses and hotels where the bellboys are unifo- uniformed mice. In 1981, Roger Ebert said the Muppets are a wonderful creation, but they lose their special quality in the Great uh, Great Muppet Caper. They behave like clones of other popular kitty superstars, like the basic cartoon heroes they once seemed destined to replace. The lack of a cutting edge hurts this movie. It's too nice, too routine, too predictable, and too safe. Did you like the first one? That is what... He did like the first one, yeah. That is safe and predictable of him. On that note, let's talk a little bit about The Great Muppet Caper. Um, Andrew is one of the co- co- uh, 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 creators of the series. I'll let you go first. Mm-hmm. You know, The Great Muppet Caper is, is really the real uh, the reason we're having this series. Because they had a theatrical redistribution of it for an anniversary i don't remember if it was last or it was 2021 or 2020 it must have been 2021 um and i went to see it um just because i needed something to do that day and like i had actually never seen a full muppet movie from beginning to end and i saw that it was directed by jim henson and i was like you know what let's give that a shot let's roll the dice on the great muppet caper in theaters now um and I was just bowled over by it. I thought it was hysterical from the word go. Uh, that opening credits sequence um, where like Gonzo and Kermit and Fozzie are talking about like how long the credits are and how no one reads credits except for the family members of the people involved <laughs> is just absolutely hysterical uh, to me. And I, I think I was not aware of just how meta the Muppets as an entity are. That is now something that's very apparent to me as somebody who's watched all the movies and, and watched some of the Muppet show that that's one of the main things they do is, is like fourth wall breaking and acknowledgement that like what you're seeing is this like production that these supposed characters have put on for you. Um, but I thought that, or I still think that this is maybe uh, the pinnacle of, of that ethos among the Muppets uh, and and Jim Henson like if the Muppet movie is kind of this almost you know a straightforward biopic of like here's how the Muppets came to be here's their relationships to each other um, here's how they finally got to, to make it to Hollywood. This is the movie they make once they're in Hollywood, right? Um, it, this is it how is, they really it, are. You know? this, this, well, no, it is not how they really <laughs> you know, are. It's, it's them respect. kind of playing around with with genre and tropes and, and you know, ridiculous roles. Um, I think that one of the things that's really fun about you know, watching the continued adventures of the Muppets is just kind of seeing the the various slots that they put all the characters in. Um, like when in Muppet Treasure Island, which you'll talk about next week, um, when they're talking uh, about this really uh, uh, intimidating captain of a ship who's about to show up and like whip everybody into shape and it's Kermit the Frog. Like it's just such a good uh, reveal. And uh you know, one of the one of the brilliant ways in which they play with that in this movie is like casting Kermit and Fozzie as identical twin reporters. <laughs> yes. Um, and people keep getting them mixed up. Yes. Like, and I, you know, he's the one with the hat. I love that Gonzo is also the Fozzie's photographer the who's just hat. trailing around them. Yeah. Fozzie's the one with the hat. And Kermit is, right? No, Fozzie's the one no. with the hat. Which one is it? Fozzie has a hat. No. Wait, no, that's Kermit. <laughs> 
I love when they're looking in the mirror together and Fozzie said, which one is me? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, but one thing that I appreciate more about this movie now that I didn't appreciate about it when I saw it is just how effortlessly they weave in all the little in-jokes of the Muppets that don't even register the first time you're watching it. Um, but like when f- they all crash to the ground in the opening sequence and like Fozzie's like chasing down a bunch of chickens like that. When I first saw it, I thought, you know, this is just a very chaotic scene. A lot of things are happening. There's a lot of Muppets around, but no, like Fozzie's a freak for chickens. Like he's just sexually attracted to chickens. Gonzo. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Gonzo. Sorry. Um, See, you're getting that mixed up too. So, there's like there's just so many like layers of delightfulness to this movie. Um, I think it's the funniest of the Muppet movies. Um, I think it's the most like technically accomplished of the Muppet movies. Um, I think that probably has something to do with the fact that it's the only one that Henson himself directed. Um, but yeah, I'm an enormous fan of this one. Um, so that that's all I'll say for now, I guess. Seth, this is one of your favorites overall. So uh, what about the Mupp- Great Muppet Caper? calls to you uh i mean there's certainly a nostalgia with this one but i i was pleasantly surprised when i watched it like six or seven years ago for the first time like as an adult and it like holy shit it was like a whole new movie to me uh it's, it's always nice when something actually holds up and it's not just uh watery eyed remembering when or something uh there's something really uh it, it, I don't know. There's something that I really do personally jive with, and I think a lot of people do, and it's really on display here, and it's what the Muppets do best, which, like Andrew touched on, is the meta ne- ne- uh, the, the meta aspect of the Muppets, which now is, like, everybody loves, everybody does all the time and stuff, but I still think there's a particular way that the Muppets do it that I prefer and it like falls into my own like humor and the way I like I feel like I almost the way it, it reminds me of the way I wind up seeing the world a lot of the time which is this sort of like there's a difference between like snarky like pointing out something and just like making it uh, like taking the piss uh, and like just like isn't it stupid we're in a, like we're just stupid that we're in a movie and it's stupid that there were puppets and like isn't it this this scene a little silly? See the silly? Muppets think it's super cool that they're in a movie. Is the difference? Yeah. yeah. Well, or or they like pass through that. They like get oh that that's like not that's step number one is acceptance that this is silly. This is uh, we are in a movie and we are singing a song, but let's go forth and do it with joy and. Uh, and with, with uh, a spring in our step and everything. And I don't know, I just uh, think that is so much funnier and sweeter and more real than just taking the piss and just like being meta for meta's sake or something like that, which is just so prevalent, I think, and is the easier way of doing it. This is the harder way of doing it. Um, it not coming across as just like, I don't know, like worthless or something. Uh, what do you make of the scene where um, Kermit is like giving Miss Piggy acting notes? <laughs> I I think that's it's really powerful and weird because uh, what we're seeing there is and a, a further breaking down of the first fourth wall where like there is a Kermit and miss piggy and you see like a little window into like the what they really are or something like they're Mm -hmm. they're, like actors in this movie but like being in in a very serious way like they're they're, like that it's funny that they are like breaking the fourth wall in that moment but it still is like this sort of like honey we got to get through this we have this is like serious (laughs) it's like (laughs) i don't know again it's like still it's committing to the bit in a way that i just really appreciate and again, it's not just like trying to make you laugh or trying to get a reaction out of you. You can tell there's like genuine care going on with this thing, um, which it would be very easy. And again, like that is the danger. And I think Jim Henson fell into it a few times of being just like a, I, 
I don't know, like, I can just kind of jump into this thing, and as long as I, like, throw Kermit and Miss Piggy in front of a bunch of kids, I'm going to make, like, millions of dollars or something. Uh, it's amazing to see those, that level of care and those levels um, of humor that you can see here, and the technical achievements, uh, which are these, I, I love how they, they adore talking about how easy the bike thing is. I've seen so many interviews with them where they just, like, Oh, like everybody thinks that was hard. It wasn't that hard. It wasn't hard to do. Making a bunch of them, a whole fleet of them, making making them going in circles, not hard at all. Yeah, not, not a big deal. I don't know why they like really make they love Muppets doing that. Muppets Tour de France. We'll do that next. Yeah, it's like the cool guy. He's you know, like saying like, "Oh yeah, I heard of that before you." Um, you know? Grace, what did you uh, what did you make of the Great Muppet Caper? The okay Muppet Caper. Uh, uh, wow. wow! Confusing. <laughs> no, not really. We can no, get through this. I don't. I don't mean that. I mean, like now, I'm starting to see it through. You know, your eye. No, I don't hate Muppets. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't hate Muppets. <laughs> if anything, I am like kindred with Miss Piggy. Like she and I, she and we, we, you know, we can. Um, but. Um, I, so the, um, I did not grow up watching the Muppets. Uh, I have no childhood attachment to them. They unfortunately for me did not inspire wonder and, um, they did not make magic for me. And maybe that's something that's missing in my life. Um, maybe if I could do it all over again, um, So I'm watching these for the first time. I watched the first Muppet movie, um, and I loved that. I thought that that was magical, like I, because I think that the magic is like all of these fabulous little characters coming together, and you know, this tiny little world. Because they're so fun, they're so funny, and like they're real. Like I'm willing to um, accept that. I know that some people aren't. Um, I know personally some people that just, they hate the bit that we are all in on is that the Muppets are real. Like these are real people they do inside the actor's studio and talk shows and all of that. Like they're real and they're fun. That's magical. But uh, this one just sort of fell flat for me because like I was excited for like a mystery, like a, not a murder mystery. You wouldn't get that. But like a whodunit is always like so fun and corny and campy. And I was excited for that. And it just felt like we sort of, my cat is trying to get involved in this um, stream. And then it felt like we sort of like lost that like mystery story and like ran with like the romance with um, Piggy and Kermit, which I love, which like I love always and then and then it's like oh but but back to that gotta pick that back up and then you know resolve it um so that that's just all that was just my biggest like oh it just felt like it got a little sidetracked for a second um but i still like this is maybe the muppet movie that feels like it has the most disposable plot. Like, the plot is just kind of an excuse for us to get from bit yeah, to bit. Yeah, and, like, f- um, from... It, it has transcended plot. Yeah. It understands that plot is silly. <laughs> but, um, I, and, like, I loved... Um, I'm surprised you guys, like, didn't talk about more, talk more about, like, that beautiful, like, Esther Williams, like, underwater dance. Like, that was that was beautiful, and that was fun to watch, and I loved seeing Piggy do that. I... Her hair, she looked like a mermaid. She looked amazing. Um, she is gorgeous. She's an icon. She's a legend. She is the moment. She's perfect. And I loved seeing that, but it didn't do anything other than, like, look what we can do with this puppet, which is cool. Like, you didn't think it was, uh, you didn't think it was hysterical to see the image of like Piggy at the top of the water fountain and like insert shots of Kermit and Charles Grodin both singing passionately to her. I, th- I thought it was funny. I thought it was cute. I was like, oh, huh. But, no, I mean... That is, for me, one of the funniest scenes I've ever seen. Uh, and I'm going to keep on... I'm not going to make this an argument. I, I it is, It's just going to happen when you're... You, that, that's very valid that you think it's okay, and it's very valid that I will just continue to gush 
about it. I'm not trying to. Put, well, listen, put we've been we've down. been talking yes. for what is? Um, let me look. No, we've been talking for 17 Never. minutes now, Never. and we ha- we've only mentioned Charles Grodin once. So I'm going to go ahead and fix that problem. Because Charles Grodin is Charles the Grodin, Charles, yeah. it's Charles unequivocally Grodin. the best part it's of this movie. Very important. Um, like Charles, <laughs> like Charles Grodin, who is like famous for his like straight man roles in like The Heartbreak Kid, in Real Life, and Ishtar, and Midnight Run, is like manic as hell in this thing. Like the first time you meet him, he's like snapping his fingers, just like walking in. Um, <laughs> Her, her Lady Holiday's idiot brother, and he's dressed so silly. He's a uh, um, his his like uh, office door says worthless parasite. I think <laughs> irresponsible parasite. Oh, irresponsible irresponsible. irresponsible parasite. It's like, and that's how he's referred to and, by. Like yes. he has this energy. Like he's not in the same movie as everybody else. You know, like he's just in his own. Like because like Diana Rigg is like putting this like performance together. Like she's somebody. Like like she's, she's so engaged in the character. And Charles Grodin is just there, doing whatever the hell he wants. Where my favorite, uh, like one of my favorite parts of him is when Piggy comes to the little like ball gala thing that they're at. And he, he like initially like comes toward her and is like trying to woo her and she's like dancing and she, there's like this there's all these other men who are like dancing around her and she's like at the center and in the back you can still see Charles Grodin just like staring at her trying to like make you know make his way toward her um, just like manic hilarious energy like the funniest I laughed at him was when he knew he had to set her up to like take the fall for the for the for the heist. And he's like struggling with it, and then it happens, and he just like completely hams it up, and he's just like, "Oh no, Miss Piggy, Miss Piggy, oh my god, oh, oh my god, god. And, oh, yes. like like just like just incredible like god tier like, performance I don't out know of him. Why I love her, I and just do, but it's just, <laughs> just like like he's trying to do like an Oscar performance or something. He's like he's mimicking some kind of big performance he would give in a real romantic lead role or something for a second. <laughs> He's the only he's the only person who like matches the energy of the Muppets in a movie because he like has the same genuine energy that they have. Everybody else is kind of like is like doing a bit or like there for a scene, uh, you know. And and Charles Grodin he's like committed. Like he showed up and he was like, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my hundred percent for this thing, and I love him for it. He has his own hand up his to control himself. Like that's you think how that's committed. how it worked. I believe it. He was method acting. Yeah, that no, like he did it. He method just like he to, in his butt, and then to puppet himself, and he does the little yeah. Charles Gordon is his own. Though I have to say, this time puppeteer. around, I really enjoyed the the sequence with John Cleese in the house. That is that's I a really good to transition us to John Cleese. Also, one of the funniest things in the movie. With just, uh, yeah, John Cleese sitting across from his wife in this beautiful house, and they are just the most boring <laughs> British couple <laughs> of all time. And all the, the wife is just talking about the weather was simply dreadful yesterday. What does he say? Like, he's going to go out to the store to get olives and something? Oh, well, you know, you know, and she asks if he's bored, and he says, like, oh, bored, that's a good one. If I, You know, if I was bored, I would go out and buy some olives or, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or cheese or something. And she's like, oh, it's suppose you would yes and then they go back to silence all while miss piggy is like traversing the house and trying to act like she lives there because she told kermit that she's lady holiday well, before then she's like she's like climbing up the house and he's like yeah i do believe that there's a pig outside climbing our house right after he <laughs> said the pigs were dead the pets are gone. Yeah, it's just it, that, that's also like I, I don't think it clocked for me the first time watching that. But John Cleese very you know solid solid cameo in that one. I like it. I like the movie as a very subtle send up of like British stuffiness. The John Cleese scene being maybe the best example of it. Um, like he has these intruders in his house and he asks them what he can do for them. And they ask for a restaurant recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> he gives it to I them. Don't mean to be <laughs> He's like, they asked me for a restaurant. More of a well, supper Well, that's club. actually yeah. a dining club. It's n- a supper club. It's not a restaurant. Yeah. Uh, mm. He refers to Miss Piggy <laughs> as a chap. Yes. 
<laughs> chap and a lizard. A chap and a lizard. That's I'll... right. A chap. A pork like chap. Fucking funny. Pork chap. Uh, pork chap. Missed opportunity. <laughs> They also they have the guy who whenever they fall out of the plane and they land in the lake that the the British guy they talked to was like I was reading is is somebody who like did the intros on British Airways for like I feel forty like he years. Had to be somebody. Yeah, so he like he would like the guy if you were flying British Airways and were going to England, That's like he'd where be like, "Hello, him. welcome okay. to England." And so, uh, and so, like that's why when they're like, "Where should we stay?" and he's like naming off stuff, like that was his whole thing. Is like he would get, is he would be on the British Airways um, flight and would be like, "If you would like to go stroll in the park, there's Hyde Park and other parks around London, you know, shit like that." And so that's also a nice little bit. They go over the English River. They do. They go over the English River. Um, what do we make uh, while we're just talking about cameos? What do we think of Peter Falk in A+. this movie? A-plus. Love it, love him. That's my man. That's my man. Feel, yeah, Peter Falk. He, he's uh, Columbo. He's Columbo. He goes over and uh, tries to sell him a watch. He gives he gives Kermit terrible advice and then tries oh, to sell him a watch yeah. about dry cleaning businesses. Do not get into the dry cleaning business. That's yeah, what this movie talking. Yeah, he does a whole me. bit about how he's Don't like, because there's always someone down yeah. the street. Yeah, exactly. He goes, I know you're sorry. I've heard it a thousand times. And he tells him this story, and it's like, you 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 are wrong. You are wrong about everything. I like I like that. Also, they just had Peter Falk. Like the rest of the cameos are kind of like British actors and 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 people well known from from England. And then they just throw but, Peter you know, Falk. He's a deeply mystery. American. In there. <laughs> He's a detective. What's he doing? Selling watches in Britain. It's a yeah, mystery. I didn't. I, did I didn't complain. I didn't I was like, complain. Hey. It was great. I was like, Peter Falk yeah. shows up. Hell yeah, let's rock and roll. Um, how did it, the? I think the cameos, like we, you know, we talked a little bit about some of the people that you see and um. In the Muppet movie, which I think is a little bit more recognizable, it's dated a little bit just because I think you know a lot of a lot of people probably watching today are not catching you know every one of the characters from the late seventies who are who are showing up in the movie. Um, but this one I think is outside of like John Cleese, um, it's a little bit tougher just because they are these kind of obscure British British faces. And how, how does everybody feel just overall about the uh, the cameos compared to the Muppet movie? I think that the joke is almost never just the existence of the cameo. It's always the the jokes that the actor doing the cameo is delivering are funny funny enough to stand on their own. Um, like I mean, this I know this is a different movie, but a, a good example of that in the Muppets canon is the uh, the Steve Martin bit in uh, the the Muppet movie. Like even if you don't know who Steve Martin is, that scene is hilarious. Just like it doesn't matter if you know who Charles Grodin or John Cleese are, it's like it's just a very, very funny scene and someone really doing a great job. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. the The mystery is this sort of thing that is. I, I, I could see where that is kind of. Yeah, they could. They maybe go too far in that meta way that they do. Sp- basically are just constantly spoiling the plot and all the strings that are holding the plot together and cutting them all. Um, yes. Yeah, you solve the mystery like well, that. It's, it's know, kind a of a more. mystery on on the part of Kermit and Fozzie to find it's out It's a mystery how stole. this movie got made. Wow. But what I was going to say is that, like, m- more than mystery we get is, is heist movie. Um, it's way more of a heist movie than yeah. it is a mystery. More in Pink, like and, Pink uh, Panther or something, because Pink Panther isn't like you're not really trying to figure out much of a thing. It's uh, Muppets Eleven trying to stop the villain. Yeah. Oh. You can see the 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 thing that this one has again reaffirming that just saw, say you know saves everything is that Charles Grodin is giving a hundred and fifty percent of effort in this movie. Yes. Too much. Like <laughs> too much. Like just, just, just. He's in this. Like at the like, even the part where they're like, uh, they're naming off the stuff that they're gonna bring to the heist, where like it's like it's like fighting bits because Charles Grodin also is doing a bit, and then they're doing their that bit as cute. well. It's just. <laughs> I brought paper towels. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Oh yeah, 
Uh, while um, while we're talking about Charles Grodin planning his heist, we should note that he has his like trio of foxy ladies who are going to help him great. do this heist. Yeah. And I don't know if their names ever get mentioned in the movie, but in the credits, they are credited as Marla, Carla, and of Darla, course. which I think is very. Well, you funny. know, he's telling <laughs> he's <laughs> telling Miss Piggy that he wants to be with her because he's tired of these slim these slim slender women who are just you know fawning over him. <laughs> <laughs> they're beautiful legs. Oh, they're beautiful. He knows what he wants. But it cannot be overstated yeah. that like a significant. <laughs> plot point in this movie is Charles Grodin wants to fuck Miss Piggy. Like, that is one of the main through lines of this movie. Yes. Yeah. Like, deeply... Yeah. Deeply I in it. love. And it's cool. Like, deeply, it's fine. It's hot. It works. Um, like... Even at the end, he's just like, I'm he's sorry. Like, I wish thinking, we could have made this right? happen. Like... <laughs> um... How, this one... So this one is, is also a little bit different it's from the Muppet movie, because I think the Muppet movie... It's, it's, you know, Kermit and Miss Piggy and Fozzie are, like, kind of lead, but it also is, like, try, it has, like, a, it's trying to capture a lot of different Muppets. In this one, definitely, I think the Muppets, like, broadly are a little bit more sidelined in this one compared to the Muppet movie, which is trying to kind of hit a lot of bases with the different characters. How did, how did y'all feel about that? Yeah, every Muppet movie has different Muppets that get spotlighted. Like, um, in, in Christmas Carol... That's really where you get the best Rizzo performance, uh, for example, right? And there's not really a standout here except maybe Miss Piggy. Um, yeah, if um, anything, she's the center. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, it, this may be like the best Piggy movie, um, but it, it it mostly like sticks with the you know the the trio of Kermit, uh, Fozzie, and and Gonzo, and it kind of relies on a lot of the human actors um, to to fill up the rest of the space. Um, and, you know, I while I do um, miss, like, getting to see more from uh, somebody like uh, Rizzo or Sam the Eagle or, or somebody like that, I think that this movie, like, is, is pretty tightly held together um, as it is. Yeah, it's just a whole different experience than like the Muppet movie where or, you know, even the show where you're kind of getting more moments with different characters who are not the kind of core folks that you see. And I'll be curious, you know, I haven't seen Treasure Island or Wizard of Oz, um, which is next week, but like seeing who kind of gets spotlighted and featured, because that's also just kind of interesting. Uh, and Jesse and I talked about it a little bit last week about how, um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the, you know, you have this actor who's puppeteering the puppet who then is giving this performance. And, like, it's kind of interesting to see, you know, who gets more more spotlight, who gets more time, and just kind of the, the, the nuances to a degree of the performances. Because, you know, like, Kermit is a little bit different of a, of a character in this than he, would, than he was in, like, the Muppet movie. Um, and probably, is, you know different also in treasure island where he's playing an actual character um it's just kind of it's interesting just from you know the jim henson frank oz like that kind of puppet role like how they they add a little nuance to the performances so it's not just you know him doing kermit the frog every time Uh, i love the focus uh of concentrating on the three and letting the other muppets be there uh to really just add to the background and elevate everything uh like the happiness hotel crew is just they are like technically background but there is a lot happening in that background uh that's what's so exciting and uh and they're always like oh yeah like just the extra chatter i like when they're all yelling it is a funny like push and pull uh sort of borderline lesson uh going on where it is like this sort of like your community versus like your individual needs where i mean it's handled very humorously where like your own brother your identical twin brother wants to go on a date with you and he's like assuming that you would bring him and then once you finally like <laughs> humorously like kermit actually does just like <laughs> i guess i will bring my identical twin brother on my date uh, it turns out that the entire uh, community of Muppets are going to go with him. Um, 
So it's always this interesting push and pull of like the group versus what Kermit maybe should have and maybe wants on his own. Uh, they do a good job at the very end, like on the actual like we're gonna save the diamond from being stolen to like incorporate everybody. Like you have the whole scene where they're like throwing the the baseball diamond all over the place um and they kind of incorporate all the different characters there which is nice they do a nice job like highlighting like who gets a chance to like shine in this moment and they kind of shine they shined a light on my girl janice a couple times she had some cute little moments like where she's tanning she's like we had the, we mm-hmm. had that last week or er, again er, uh, and her. then when she like when there's the chatter the chatter the chatter everybody goes quiet she's like and then if I want to go to the top of the speech, it's my body, Mom. Who are you to t-? Like, that is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> that is hilarious so when they, like, you know, decide, like, okay, we're going to throw her a little moment, and then we're going to, like, have this new cabbie character that's, you know, we're going to spotlight so him. Funny. Beauregard. That's I his name. There. Yeah, I just so don't it's know like how they to get, get there. to the core. You're going to want to go, you're going to want to make a U-turn. But, like, yeah, they did a fun job like highlighting um some of the Muppets giving them their moment but I thought that Gonzo really shined for me his rich interior life as this photographer he's having this like (laughs) he's he's got series and he's going through movements for a study on legs under you know like calves like under table kneecaps he's got his dark room moment this like blow up you know Antonioni like he's he's doing so much for me and he's so cute and he's so well dressed like he is such a sharp little character and so and so fun to watch honestly like, best muppet i'm glad i think he might be my up, favorite i think he does like, such a good job as like the the wild third wheel kind of character uh in the background because i think it would be very easy on paper to be like oh and then gonzo does something like just totally like nuts or something but they're they're still handled with care, like the things that he does. <gasps> There's the baby cat. Hello. I like. Doesn't she I look like, like Sam when Eagle? On the plane, and it's. She looks like Sam Eagle. <laughs> yeah, kinda. You're all weirdos. <laughs> You're all weirdos. Yeah. I like. I like on the plane when it's when they're all sitting there in their crates, and it says bear, frog, and for Gonzo, it just says whatever. Gonzo. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. There's so a many bear, good running jokes Gonzo. with Gonzo. There's the the fact that he's obsessed with chickens or sexually attracted to chickens. His There's the fact wife. that nobody knows what the heck he is, and that he's like such an adrenaline junkie that he basically has a death wish at all times. Like, he he hails a cab by jumping into traffic and then is frustrated that they didn't run over him. Yeah, it he says, yeah, Fozzie says, like, that That was awful. And then Gonzo says, well, we're just going to have to do it again. <laughs> He's like, it's great when it works. He also gets his uh, nose stuck in an elevator while, like, ogling Marla, Carla, and Darla. And then offers Fozzie, like, do you want to stick your... It's pretty fun. You want to stick your nose in this elevator door. (laughs) What is his nose? Like, it's fun. He gets pleasure from that. Like, is that... Yeah. Like... I think so. Oh, my God. God. Just wears it on his nose. Gonzo also a character just, like, living in his own movie. Just, like, you know... No. Well, speaking of his own movie, he does kind of have his own movie. We're not doing it on the series, but if people like Gonzo, if people like me are, are freaks for Gonzo, they uh, they should watch Muppets from Space, which is all dedicated to Gonzo. Um, any 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 final thoughts? Any final lines that we 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 can't be remiss without mentioning? Thieves aren't breathing down your neck. It's a great one because uh, <laughs> Lady Holiday is like yapping about like I feel like thieves are breathing down your neck and he li- like Charles Grodin literally breathes down her neck when he says it. It's so funny. Uh, yeah, I liked I. Yeah, I can't I can't say it enough. Just how funny the whole split screen like Kermit is singing about true love in one stream and, he, and, and Charles, Charles is, is singing about true and love. And he's from actually the stream singing. That's one. his actual oh, yeah. voice. It's he's like going an opera for it. Voice. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. I I how also will I choose, I really like, says Miss Piggy, and I'm like, I don't know, bitch. I don't know how you'll choose. Oh, I just thought that um, what is it, Diana Reg? Like, I thought that she brought like the melodrama. She was so cute and funny, and like such a like hoity British lady. Um, 
she was a delight because I was thinking about the way she delivered the thieves are right on my neck like so dramatic and then when they ask her like Lady Holiday will you ever hire a pig again well I shall certainly think twice about it like that is just like such a silly little like (laughs) I I love uh, her meta moment when like they Piggy asks her like why she's going on about something, and she says, "Well, it's plot exposition. It has to go somewhere." <laughs> it's got to go somewhere. Yeah, this is yeah. very funny. That was cute. Yes, it would be so. Uh, she'd be such an easy character to sideline and be like, "All oh, right, you're you're playing straight woman to funny Miss Piggy or something," and she still has like these like really goofy ditzy sort of lines. Um, I will say if we're just adding final things like. I mentioned at the at the top that this is maybe like the most technically accomplished Muppet movie. Like when I saw the the you know the parade of bikes going through the park, uh, I was just absolutely amazed and and having the like how did they do that moment. Um, all all the um, the like the water ballet stuff that we've already talked about is amazing, uh, but I also think that they get a lot of. Uh, mileage out of some very simple uh kind of almost stupid things like i will never get tired of them just throwing them up it you know <laughs> like uh uh gonzo yes. getting thrown out into traffic or people getting <laughs> thrown out of yeah. the plane or something um very very funny and like the i think the rapidity of jokes in this movie is is really impressive like it almost plays like a marx brothers or a mel brooks movie with like just the ratio of jokes like even if not all of them hit for you you're getting so many jokes per minute yeah it it feels a lot like a like you know it's definitely inspired by like Bugsby Berkeley um you know for a lot of it but I think also it reminds me a little bit of like a Marx Brothers movie in terms of just like it's like there's a plot it's it's kind of like any Marx Brothers movie there's a plot it's not really that important it's just there to like jumpstart Groucho lines and so that's that's what you're there for there's no real like who cares about what the the plot is you're just there for the Muppets to do silly stuff and everybody else to react uh, the Muppet movie before this uh, Muppets Take Manhattan is like the most plot heavy uh, is Muppet. that before this? Yeah, it's before this, I believe. Oh, um, that's wacky. And like, Muppets Take Manhattan, I don't know if this is a controversial statement or not. I think it's a terrible movie. I think it, it is like an experiment with trying to bring like a level of like gritty social realism to the Muppets that just completely fails. I'm glad that this it's, movie... It's at least the least funny. Yeah, th- this movie being so kind of detached from reality and just kind of following its own little flight of fancy, I think completely works. That's what I can't believe. I, yeah. I, I really thought this was number two uh, Thanks, Zach. <laughs> for such a long time. And that's why I have always compared the two. Like, And I think a lot of people do. Like, It's sort of like a New Hope, Empire Strikes Back sort of thing. Uh, and for me, I definitely lean towards Caper, but I still love the first one. Oh, you're I right. Do think Manhattan is would, three. Manhattan That's comes three. after this. Okay. Yeah. I was going to say, in my notes, I introduced it as the second one. So now I don't know. Wow, they really <laughs> fixed themselves. Uh, but uh, yeah, instead, they, they broke down a little bit after this one. But yeah, comparing the two is interesting because I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it's hard to choose them, but I do choose this one because it does feel like this is the next level of the Muppets. We get to know them like deeper. And I appreciate what happens in the first one, that it is, like, it's the most emotional. And I can understand why that would be someone's favorite because of that. Um, But in some ways, it almost feels like, I don't know, I don't want to say, like, easier, uh, but, like, low-hanging fruit emotionally, like, more of, like, reaching for, like, some kind of, like theater big moment making you cry and stuff like that um where this has a i don't know there's a lot of depth here that is like real subtle underneath like it's it's and it's happening quite often during the comedy and during uh, um the the jokes uh, the the plot the crime all of that stuff it again is very much about how like we transcend uh we can transcend plot and transcend all this uh, starting from meaninglessness and going 
to like okay well yeah but like now we're gonna we know it's a movie but we're going to make one hell of a movie um i just love that grand gesture of it all but i don't know where do you guys land with it compared to the first one i think it's better than the first one personally but i like the first one a lot too i love them both yeah charles groden's in this one so if Charles Grodin was in the first one, then that would also complicate things. But Is the first the one also one? has Orson Welles. That was a... Whoa. Like, when he turned around in that chair and I was like, whoa! Yeah, the Orson Welles cameo is probably the best Muppets cameo, I gotta say. <laughs> I forgot about that. Alright, well, that will wrap Orson up Welles. this episode. Wait, 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 wait. What we haven't everybody's been dying to know, like what is everybody's Muppet? We can't just talk have y'all done that yet? Like we can't just talk about the Muppets like, and then what not Muppet say, like, are you? Who's your favorite? Yeah. We haven't done that. Have y'all done well, that yet? You know, like uh, last year for Halloween, uh, Jesse and I dressed up as or no no not last year, the year before last for Halloween. Jesse and I dressed up as Muppets. She was Janice and I was Zoot. Oh, my favorite Muppet movie letterbox review was uh, I really wish I could smoke a joint with Janice. <laughs> She's so cute. Hell yeah, probably ripping weed. That's why her eyes are closed. Mine too. Uh, I think I'm pretty boring. I, I, well, yeah, I, 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 like, I, like, I like Kermit. I don't know. Are we going with favorite or like your the no, Muppet like, you identify who you with? Are. Yeah. Who you, I, I said. I don't know. I, I'm I'm tempted to say Gonzo, for you. I think I want to be. I I, I, I strive for Kermit, but I become. I, I usually wind up being Gonzo. Yes. I think aspiring for Gonzo is a noble goal. It's true. Maybe I should just be. Should be myself. <laughs> no, a little space alien thrill seeker. Well, I think. Yeah, I think I think her. As much as I want to be a piggy, like as much as I like see myself in her um in my I, I think I might be more of a Janice now that I've actually like seen a single Muppets movie so I think he's got a lot of hang ups you know yeah I yeah I, I identify with the with the with the eye patch cat oh, that's God. stuck under a radiator <laughs> in the happiness hotel in this yeah. movie <laughs> <laughs> Who 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 is quietly the best Muppet in this movie? <laughs> Shout out! I think you might be Fozzie Bear's act. <laughs> waka waka. Well, who is Andrew? I also, you know, I, don't, I, I also have. Is he? Zoot. He's Zoot. I don't know. I was are, Zoot I for know. Halloween. I don't yeah, know if Kermit that's the Muppet the that I most Kermit. identify as. Um, yeah, the Kermit of the or, I might be Kermit. Or like you're a little bit of a scooter. That's an insult, yeah. I think. <laughs> I think so. I always like Scooter a lot. Scooter's all around because his uncle owns the He's beer. nice and... <laughs> You're a little right. bit of a Scooter. Oh, That's true. Never mind. He's a yes. nepo baby. Breaking news. Scooter is a nepotism baby. Scooter has no real purpose. <laughs> He's a nice, sweet boy. Brightly colored. I'd like to be Rizzo, to be honest, but I don't think I'm that cool. Mm. Rizzo rules. Yeah, you gotta be a pretty cool guy to have Rizzo be your zodiac Ooh, sign. What about uh, the like shrimp guy from Up Is From Space? I forget his name. I mean, he's cool. He rules. Or uh, you know, maybe at, at my true uh, top of the mountain moment, I am the Swedish chef. I think, uh, you know, full third eye opened. I am the Swedish chef. Fully realized. <laughs> We'll figure out who our true Muppets are by the end of the series. Yeah, you just have to take enough, take enough acid and you'll figure it out. Pepe, Pepe the Prawn is the one I was thinking of. All right. Well, that will wrap up this episode of Cinematary. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash cinematary, on Twitter and Instagram at handle at cinematary, and on Letterbox at letterbox.com slash cinematary, where we will list all the episodes, or all the uh, movies that we talked about in this episode um if you would like to support the show and uh 
you know, submit, give us a dollar and be like, this is who your Muppet is. Um, head to patreon.com slash cinematary. Thank you to our patrons, Cam, Chad Newsom, Candace Sisson, Ron Hayes, Teresa Marthothi, Titus Arthur, and Tyler Chandler. Thank you so much for your patronage. Next week, we're going to be continuing the Muppet series with uh, Muppet Treasure Island and the Muppet Wizard of Oz. Muppet. If you pledge $1 now, I will get on a motorcycle dressed as Miss Piggy and crash there, through a boom. stained glass window. Look at that. Uh, and it would be it, it would be a beautiful image that will stay in your mind forever. Do they have a Muppet return Jump to Oz? Like Gonzo. What a bargain. Jump in front of an Uber. Like Gonzo. I'll do that too. Alright, until until Seth breaks through a stained glass. Thanks y'all for listening. We'll see you next week.